If this is your first time joining us, why uh, we are actually spending a year going through 52 different character studies uh, that should be evident in the life of a uh, in the life of a Christian. Oh, we've talked about uh, numerous. This is our tenth week. We've taken uh, taken a look at numerous topics. This week we're looking at the topic of humility, and our study guide is a. Um, a journal it's called the disciples journal and if if you're interested in getting a copy of this um, just um, shoot me an email to the church and I'll see if I can't get one to you uh, my email is greg.jones at fcob.net uh, you could also access it by going to the church's website uh, um, at the bottom of each one of these character studies there is a self-evaluation section uh, asks several questions for us to consider as we explore the topic and as if you've looked down over the ones for this week on humility um, you get the impression that biblical humility should inform our attitudes toward others it's questions like uh, uh, I mean are you willing to say I was wrong please forgive me um, do people say I'm a good listener? Um, do I give praise to others? You know, those kind of questions that um, that pop up there. <clears throat> Biblical humility, and you kind of get the sense here in those self-evaluation questions that biblical humility should affect our relationships. That much is clear. So we're going to take a look at uh, a few examples today in transforming the world. We'll dive right into a story that Jesus tells out of Luke 18 in just a moment. I'll be right back. In the meantime, this is Transforming the World. In Luke 18, um, specifically 10 through 14, Jesus tells a story about two men who had gone to the church to pray. One was a great religious leader. Uh, the other man, he still struggled to get his life in order. He uh, would sometimes cheat others. Uh, he was deceptive. He probably hung out with the wrong people. But he knew that his life was a wreck, and he went to church asking God to forgive him of his sin. In the story, one man was broken another was boastful and what we learn is that humility is not always seen by our religious activity it is found at the actually <laughs> our humility is found at the foot of the cross for lack of a better way the Pharisees certainly did not demonstrate humility that much is sure but the tax collector absolutely and Jesus even confesses this the Pharisee may have done an awful lot of religious things that appeared to be humble. Okay, I give a tenth of my income to the church. That has the appearance of humility. Oh, this isn't my money. It's all yours, God. You know. But through his words, through this guy's words, through this Pharisee's words, that you can see the attitude of his heart. Um, and in the attitude of his heart, there was absolutely no humility at all. Verse 11, he's like that tax collector. That's pride. Horrible, poisonous pride. And the Pharisee actually said, I'm so much better than him. But in contrast, in contrast, the tax collector comes along and admits that his life was a wreck. And he pleaded with God to be merciful. In this scene, in this sense, we demonstrate biblical humility when we put God in his proper place. In the scene, the tax collector put God in his proper place. And in the same sense, in the same sense that you and I demonstrate biblical humility when we put God in in his proper place. I mean, if, if you look at this Pharisee, he almost treated God as his peer. I mean, seriously, it, it puts you in mind of the Pharisee 
standing around the water cooler and God's there. And a Pharisee comes along and says, you don't know what kind of week I had last week. Ah, oh, these great and trim. And then he looks at God and says, so what kind of week did you have? I mean, uh, literally, that's, that's the impression you get from this Pharisee. Boasting about everything that he had done in front of God and challenging God to top him. Talk about arrogance. The tax collector recognized his place, a place of humility, humility beneath the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So yeah, okay. This needs to be said. Yes, you are valuable to God. Yes, God is transforming you into a person of honor. Yes, God will do great things through you, but he is still God and you are not. Biblical humility shows continued respect and honor to the only one who can save. He is still worthy of all our praise, right? So you and I need to never become so comfortable in our relationship with God that we end up treating him like this Pharisee did. Regardless of how long we might be saved, we need to demonstrate the same utter dependence on God's grace as we see in this tax collector. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. That's the words of a truly humble heart. Recognizing that God is God. It's one of the things that sort of balances out all the other things that I have said earlier. You are valuable. You are worth. In God's eyes, you have worth. He is working in your life and shaping you into someone who can do great and glorious things in his name. And God will, if you will allow him, God will do great things through you. But he's still God. And you are not. And when we keep this in mind, we don't allow God's evaluation and God's work in us to help us become, uh, we don't allow God's evaluation and work to make us become prideful and arrogant and self-centered like the Pharisee. We recognize our place at the foot of the cross. And as we'll discover tomorrow, we'll recognize, I'll recognize my place at the foot of the cross and you'll recognize yours. And, I, and you and I will see ourselves in a whole different light. We'll look at that tomorrow. Um, a lesson from, from Philippians chapter 2 tomorrow. Meantime, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. This is a difficult subject, this lesson on humility, but I think it's a valuable one. I'm so thankful it's in this, in this study guide. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks again. I'll talk to you then. Have a good day. Bye.